he's speaking about graphic supercapacitors. I asked him why we would be interested in graphic supercapacitors, because I don't know what that means. He told me you might be interested in charging your cell phone or your laptop in 30 seconds. I said, yes, tell me more about that. Please join me in welcoming Rick Kaner. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And I wanna start off, I need to introduce what graphene is. Graphene is a single layer of carbon. It's the lightest and strongest material ever discovered. It was discovered by Novosov and Geim in 2004. They shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010. So how many of you think your eyes are good enough to see a single layer of carbon? Anybody? No. Well, it turns out that <laughs> that graphene is one of the darkest materials ever discovered. So a single layer attenuates 2.5% of visible light, and your eye's good enough to see that. So I, I normally I'd pass around samples, but I'll have to ask you, if you really want to see it, just find me after the seminar or around, and I'll, I'll show you what graphene looks like. Okay, so here's graphene. The single layer of carbon, it just looks like chicken wire, if you like. And you can stack it up and you can make graphite, that's this. You can roll it up and make carbon nanotubes, or you can put in a few things and make what are called buckyballs. If you look at this picture, what you'll see here is this is a block of graphite about the size of your thumb, and we're hitting this with a laser right here. Now, normal material, of course, would get hot in three dimensions, but graphite's not a normal material. It actually is only getting hot in two dimensions, as you'll see. So if you touch here, you'll burn yourself. If you go up here, it's cold. And the reason this is, is because thermal conductivity follows the bonding, and the bonding's all along the layers. And it also follows the conduction electrons, which are moving in the same direction. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties. All right. All right, when it blinks the next time, you'll see how Novosov and Geim discovered graphene. They were using scotch tape, and they took that piece of pyrolytic of graphite and they literally peeled it with scotch tape. Well, this is something I've been doing for undergraduates at UCLA for the past 25 years. And never in my wildest dreams would I imagine that you could peel this down to a single layer. But they believed they could, and what they did is they kept peeling. They took one piece of scotch tape against another. And when they were done, they took that and they put it on a piece of silicon and they saw an interference pattern. And so from that interference pattern, they realized that they had made a single layer of, of graphene. Okay, other ways to make graphene include chemical vapor deposition. This is growing it on copper and exfoliation, just literally peeling apart the layers. Um, what we do is I actually got started on graphene in 2000, about four years before Novoselov and Geim did their work, when one of my colleagues um, did some calculations and decided that graphene would be the, s the best reinforcement for polymers. And so we did some intercalation exfoliation, and I actually have a patent going back to 2002 on graphene. After Novoselov and Geim did their work, I switched to graphite oxide. And graphite oxide is a material that's a precursor to graphene, and it disperses in water as single sheets. You can see a dispersion of it here. Okay, so what we can do with graphite oxide is we can take it and we can make graphene paper, we can make electronic devices, we can make sensors, we can make graphite oxide, and I'll show you about light scribes, some of you may be familiar with this, and then we'll get to super caps. Okay, first of all, graphite oxide, we hit it with a reducing agent, we turn it into graphene, this is in water, it disperses light, and it's a charged stabilized colloid. What that just means is if you throw in salt, it comes out. And this is an atomic force microscope picture, and you can actually see the individual layers of graphene. There, there they are. If we take a lot of graphene, literally thousands of layers, we just run it through a piece of filter paper, peel it off the filter paper, we get what I'll call graphene paper. So there it is. It's not graphite. Graphite's actually ordered. This is just random layers of pure carbon. All right, now what I want to show you is here's graphite oxide. It's this golden material. And we discovered if you hit it with a flash of a camera, it deoxygenates. It turns into graphene. And I'm going to try to show you that with this movie. And take a look. We're going to light this on fire. And here we're going to hit it with a flash of a camera. 
And what you'll see is this looks sort of like a thing you might use on the 4th of July. But I'm going to do that one more time. I think this will work. Okay, watch this one. This is a flash of a camera hitting this. It absorbs the light, converts it to heat, and literally blows apart. Now, that's very uncontrolled, but we can control this using something called light scribe. And so that's what we're going to look at next here. Okay. We seem to be stuck on this one. <laughs> we seem to be stuck on this slide. Not sure why. Ah, perfect. Okay. So here's LightScribe, and some of you may have one of these. You can purchase them for about $25. They go into your hard drive, and they have a laser, 780 nanometer laser, and they're used to label compact disks. Well, we're interested in the laser and the magnifying glass, and we use that to produce graphene. And so what you'll see here is an ordinary piece of plastic that we've coated with graphite oxide, so it's golden brown. We hit it with the laser, and we can make any pattern you like very, very easily. In fact, here's a publication from last year where we paid an artist for a picture of a human with, with a computer brain, and we reproduce this with what we'll call laser scribe graphene. And so what we do is where the laser hits it, it turns to graphene, and we can control the intensity and the number of hits. And so the light part is graphite oxide, the dark part is graphene. Okay. This is a redox reaction, and all this does is shows that graphene is 100 times faster than graphite. And graphite's a standard electrode. And so you'll forgive me the one complicated slide. We'll just go on to the next one. So why would you want graphene as an electrode? Well, as you heard, one of the things we all have problems with is our computers and our cell phones, whenever you want them, they seem not to be charged. And you can literally spend hours charging them. Often you plug them in overnight so they're better in the morning. And ultimately, it'd be nice to be able to have electric vehicles. Well, all that depends on storing lots of charge and being able to get it back quickly. And so the idea is if we could make supercapacitors, we could store charge very quickly. And things like even solar cells, of course, the sun only shines part of the day and the wind only blows part of the day. So you need really good storage devices if you're going to make these kinds of, of Earth-friendly technologies available all day and all night. So what we're interested in is improving capacitors and making supercapacitors. And supercapacitors exist. They're a technology that 10 years ago did not exist. Uh, we're all familiar with batteries, but a supercapacitor basically has two electrodes. It has a plus electrode and a minus electrode. It can be charged much faster than a battery. It usually doesn't store nearly as much energy. And so this is a, oh, this plot didn't come out very well. But suffice it to say that a supercapacitor is to taking the best attributes of a capacitor that you can charge and discharge it very rapidly and trying to add enough energy density to compete with batteries. So here's what we're trying to do. And what I'll show you is we've been able to do this with graphene. And the reason this works is graphene has a very high specific surface area. So about 550 meters squared per gram. And so what that means is, well, I'm sorry, the capacitance is 550 farads per gram. The surface area is up to 2,300 meters per gram. And so the surface, a running track or a tennis court, is on the order of several hundred meters squared per gram. So we're talking about the surface, a single gram of this material can have the surface area of about four tracks, running tracks. OK, so here's what we do. We take our, our DVD drive. We put a piece of plastic. We coat it with graphite oxide so it's golden brown. We hit it with the laser. We convert it to graphene. We take two pieces of that. We put this together with a separator. And that is our supercapacitor. And here's what it looks like. You can hold these in your hand. They're completely flexible. This is probably the key slide. This is graphite oxide, the layers of it. We hit it with the laser. It blows off CO2, and this is the structure that we get. So we get this beautiful porous structure. It's electrically interconnected, and that's exactly what you want. When I was a postdoctoral fellow, my advisor talked about holy graphite would be the ultimate electrode material, and that's essentially what we made, holy in the sense of H-O-L-E-Y. 
And when we look at this, here's what's currently used in supercapacitors, activated carbon. Here's our material, laser scribe graphene. And it has all the attributes you want. It's completely flexible. And what this shows is on bending, you can bend as many times as you want, and it, resistance doesn't change. You can scan it as if you're using it for a supercapacitor, and this is comparing it. This is a normal supercapacitor. This is ours. This is the capacitance, so it, it works quite well. It's very fast. Its time constant is 30 milliseconds compared to 10,000 millisec ten milliseconds for a normal carbon-based capacitor. And so it's very promising. It's completely flexible. It, its characteristics don't change. We can put these together in series and in parallel. So if you look at this, in, if we do this in water, we have a one volt cell. If we put four of them together in series, we get out four volts. If we put two in series and two in parallel, we double the voltage, we double the area under the curve. And so if you want to make something that will run your computer, you simply stack them together like you would batteries in series and parallel. Okay, here's the cycle life and the shelf life. You'll see it's extremely stable. We've done this 10,000 times. You should be able to run this millions of times unlike batteries. It has very good shelf life. So if you put it on a plot versus regular lithium ion batteries, we're starting to approach the energy density of a lithium ion battery. And so the promise is for flexible electronics, flexible keyboards, and electronic patches. And what I want to do is show you a movie that some of you may have seen. It's been making the rounds. It was made for the Sundance Film Festival last month. And this is our, before I show you that, this is our latest work on making what are called micro super caps, little patches that you can make electronic devices. Okay, so now I need to plug this in. We realized that what we had was better for a different application. Graphene is a single layer carbon. It's one of the strongest materials ever known, and it's completely flexible. The discoveries of graphene won the Nobel Prize in 2010. However, the method they used to make it, which was taking graphite and peeling it with scotch tape, is not practical. So we set out to find a better method. We start with graphite oxide, which is a water dispersal material. We then coat it onto sheets of plastic. We hit it with a light from a laser deoxygenates, it turns it into graphene. So it's both very exciting because we made all organic graphene in a very simple process using a consumer grade DVD drive that you can find everywhere. But the real discovery was yet to come. I think the eureka moment that you're looking for was not exactly that. The real exciting discovery came when Maher dragged me into the lab and he said, take a look at this. And he just took a light bulb and he just turned it on with this little piece of graphene. But the amazing thing is, it doesn't stop working. After charging for two or three seconds, he ran this light for over five minutes. I thought we have something very important. I, I thought the world changed at that point. Okay, let's, let's talk about the future. Batteries have a bad reputation, but what we're working on are supercapacitors. And supercapacitors you can think of as a charge storage device like a battery, except it charges and discharges 100 to 1,000 times faster. A battery stores a fair amount of charge, but it charges and discharges slowly. A capacitor puts out a high output, but it doesn't store much charge. So like the flash to a camera, a supercapacitor which combines the best attributes of both. If you think about all the electronic devices you have, right now, every time you need one, you realize, oh, I forgot to charge it up. But imagine if you could take that same device, plug it in the wall for 30 seconds or a minute, and be ready to go. Life would be very different. And eventually, we'll get to things like electric vehicles. Now, you pull into a gas station. Well, you would pull into a charging station, and within a minute, it would charge up your car. If you think of batteries, batteries are all composed of a lot of metals, often they're toxic metals. And so in fact, you're not allowed to throw a battery away. But if you had something that's carbon-based, it wouldn't matter. Carbon-based, you can put it in your compost bin and use it to grow vegetables. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a scientist. And so my goal has always been to develop something that will change people's lives.
Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Please. So that, that, that's a good question. How far are we away from practical uses? So we actually started working with a leading super cap company and our hope is that if this all works out to introduce it into consumer products within a couple years. Okay, so th that's a good question. The question is, what are the safety of these? We've all heard of the problems with lithium ion batteries and even the Dreamliners having problems. It turns out that supercapacitors are very different than lithium ion batteries. There's no toxic metals in these materials. And so there's th you can use materials that are, that are not non-flammable. And so you, you do have high charge and so you have to design them correctly but there haven't been the safety issues. I don't think you've, you've heard of, of problems with supercapacitors. They're currently being used, if you go to China today, in buses. All the new electric buses are based totally on supercapacitors based on carbon. And the idea is that a bus, as people are getting on and off, you can charge them within a minute or two. And so as long as you, you only need to go 10 or 20 miles and the bus returns to its base station, that works. Of course, if, if electric cars are going to use these things, you have to have much greater mileage. You've you got to be able to go further. But these are already in use, and as I mentioned, they didn't exist 10 years ago. Go ahead. Sure. So the question is, could you do this at home? In theory, yes. You can buy graphite oxide. It should be very cheap because you just take graphite and you oxidize it. Unfortunately, the people who sell it realize that they can make a lot of money. So if you try to buy it, it's fairly expensive. Um, and the quality is not usually that great. So a few people have tried this at home. I haven't had anybody tell me that it hasn't worked, but I haven't had anybody come to me and tell me it has. We make all our own materials in the lab, and so, you know, in theory, you can do this. I, I, I don't know. Yes. So the question is, are there any politics involved with this? Well, like any other endeavor, there probably are. I haven't encountered anything. The, the, our, our government has actually put a fair amount of money into nanotechnology and, and graphene. And so I've, been, I've had many government grants f all the way from the National Science Foundation I've had money from the microelectronics industry. So people are interested in seeing these new technologies used. So I, I, don't, I don't see any real problems along those lines. Please. So you suggested that energy density uh, getting closer to lithium ion. What about the volume energy density? Excellent question. So the question is, I, I said that we have a mass density close to lithium ion batteries. But the question is volume density. Because if you're going to put this in a vehicle, it can't be too large. It turns out that we've, we've actually done very well with compacting these materials. And their volume density is actually approaching that also of lithium ion batteries. But I would say right now we're not there. So I don't expect to see this in your car anytime soon. But using this for cell phones or for small electronic devices will, will, is something that's realistic. And so I'm hoping that that's, that's what comes on. Now, I'm being told that, that my time is up, so thank you again, and if anybody wants to hear more about it, just come see me.